my name is Charles Morgan. I am just Charlie. I currently serve as Associate Dean in the College of Architecture and Director of the Regional City Planning Program. Um, it is a personal and professional honor to participate in this event, and it is the mission of the university, the College of Architecture, and every unit in the College of Architecture to seek excellence in teaching, research, and service. And it is events like this that illustrate and personify that commitment. Now the fun stuff. How many people here are alumni of the College of Architecture? Great, great. How many prospective students at the College of Architecture programs are out there? Okay, by the end of the day, there's going to be a lot more hands than that. My background is as a planning educator. And while I will never be the most polished public speaker, there will be very few people you run across that are more sincere when they talk about communities, community revitalization, and the making of place. What's unique about planning is that it involves elected, appointed officials, citizens, and, and practitioners. How many elected officials do we have here today? How many appointed officials, commissioners, arts districts, planning commissioners? Professional practitioners? Amazing, amazing. Together, it is these three groups, um, and many of you play dual roles, uh, that contribute to the making of great communities. What we're going to talk a lot about today lends itself to planning processes, and many of you are involved in community processes, community planning processes, know that it can be a long, frustrating, but rewarding endeavor. We're going to hear today about a lot of the tools that help make great places, and I really like these discussions because these tools are applicable in urban and rural situations, and perhaps more importantly, they're applicable as we uh, face a, a, an increasingly difficult fiscal climate. One of the things as a planning educator is that knowledge creation is maybe the hallmark of the university, but knowledge dissemination to practitioners and elected appointed officials and community groups is equally as important. I become a better educator by learning from practitioners, and that is why I open my remarks saying it. I have a personal and professional honor by spending time with the audience and these folks you'll hear from. Today, you will hear a lot about making, but when it's all said and done, you're going to hear about community. And I think that underlines everything you will hear today. With that, I want to introduce our speakers. And the plan is for about an hour and a half, um, speakers uh, are allotted about 20 to 25 minutes of time, and we want to ensure adequate time for questions. So begin uh, thinking about questions that you may have. Immediately following this session, we will adjourn to the union. And so I want to introduce our, our speakers. Fred Kent is our first speaker today, and he is truly, when you hear this, it's true, the leading authority on revitalizing city spaces and one of the foremost thinkers in livability, smart growth, and the future of the city. You've heard this a lot, Fred. As, as the founder and president of the nonprofit organization Project for Public Spakers, Project for Public Spaces, he and his team Thank give you. presentations or train more than 10,000, I'll speak faster. Okay. No, I don't. <laughs> Fred and I spoke, and he will talk a lot about his projects. With that, I introduce to you Great. Fred Kent. Thank you. <laughs> I got to have a clicker. Uh, that was the best uh, introduction I've ever had. <laughs> There's no point in, uh, you know, you can read about it, and I'd rather talk to you. So, uh, placemaking. Um, we kind of uh, got it about 20 years ago. Someone from England, who was our PR person, uh, said, You really should think of yourselves as placemakers. And then we wrote a book called How to Turn a Place Around, 
And we had 11 principles. And the first principle was the community is the expert. And that turned us from even thinking we were an expert and, and humbled us greatly because when you realize that the community is the expert, if you have ways of getting to them and getting their input and their excitement and their ownership and their passion, uh, they are the experts. Uh, and the professionals are really resource. And so we think of ourselves as a resource and a catalyst and community organizers. Uh, and not really, uh, you know, sure, I, I've traveled five and a half million miles and I've been everywhere, almost everywhere in the world and I've seen every great public space and every bad one uh, and a lot of bad ones. And the newer ones are much worse and they're getting worse instead of better. Uh, and the way to correct that is with people in the communities who realize what they're getting and what they're getting is not what they want. Uh, so uh, we've been involved over the last four years with the UN Habitat and a foundation in uh, Stockholm uh, around developing language for Habitat 3, which was last fall, around place, placemaking in public spaces. And it was adopted. Uh, but the fellow who heads up uh, the UN Habitat, uh, Dr. Close, uh, he was going around the world saying, we need a new paradigm for the postmodern city or for communities in general. And we believe that's absolutely correct, that we've been for the last um, 70 years, people say, we've been on a track that's more defined by the disciplines than by the community. And that's transitioning very fast, and I'll, sh I'll share that with you. So we had a writer uh, a while back who was writing for us, and we found this in some of his writings, and uh, I really like it. Uh, you know, if architecture is frozen music, and music can be bold and dynamic and uh, iconic, uh, and urban planning is composition, uh, creating the setting, then placemaking is improvisational street performance. And that's what it, to me, that's really what it is. Uh, because improvisation uh, by people in a community is just natural. It's organic. And so we uh, think that placemaking is a really basic community process. And we've actually been doing it for centuries. Uh, organically, naturally in communities, we've been solving problems, creating opportunities, creating places. The last 70 years, we kind of got stuck on the professionals doing it for us or to us. So we have the traffic engineers doing their deal. You have the landscape architects, to me, narrowly focused around landscaping planning, not connected to design uh, the way it could be or should be. Uh, and so the community process is one that can fundamentally change that. It can get those professions out of jail uh, and create this organic process that's improvisational, uh, that localizes its economic development and its scale to each community. And the outcomes uh, are really quite profound, inclusive, healthy, sustainable outcomes. Uh, today, we all know this, we have the communities that are, the institutions are separated by roads and parking lots, and that we are not pulling them together around place. Place has not been an agenda for so long. And the future is really about doing that. Now, we don't use words like parks because parks to us have become too much about green space. We love green space, but we really like the idea of multi-use. So when you think of a school building and you think about what are the other uses that can be, uh, a market, a playground, you know, all kinds of things. You start opening up the door. And, and a library is my particular, I love libraries, but I love libraries that are no longer in a box. They're outside the box and around the box. And so you can change the whole dynamic of every single institution if you think of it as more multi-use. Uh, and there's so many opportunities, especially commercial opportunities. Uh, one of our, our funders uh, a couple of days ago said, you're not a nonprofit, you're tax exempt. So what we can do as a tax exempt organization, we can create economic opportunities through what we call lighter, quicker, cheaper uh, job creation for people in communities using public spaces 
in a very holistic way, more multi-use way. Uh, so what I'm going to say to you and suggest to you that the most exciting times are right around the corner. Uh, if we turn everything upside down to get it right side up, we can get from inadequate to extraordinary. And by the end of my short presentation, I hope you'll be on board with that. So I started working 40 plus years ago with William Holly White. Uh, I never had lunch with him until late in his life uh, because lunchtime was the time to go out and street watch, watch the streets. He ran something called the Street Life Project. So every day we would go out and do time-lapse photography. And one of the things that I did is I studied the day in the life of a wastebasket. Uh, and it was fascinating, you know, me studying the base of wastebasket use. Well, the wastebasket was pretty much like that, and it was flat on the top, and it was on the corner of uh, uh, 59th Street and Lexington Avenue, right near Bloomingdale's, if you know it. Uh, but there are a lot of people, 39,000 people going by this wastebasket every day. But the wastebasket was here, and there was a lamp post right here. And there was always someone standing between the wastebasket and the lamppost uh, out of the flow of traffic. Well, one time I was there watching this, taking time lapse actually, uh, and this um, uh, guy came up with his, with his briefcase and opened the, the um, briefcase on top of the, 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 the wastebasket. And a few minutes later, this woman came running across the street you know, 39,000 people walking back and forth, a lot of people. And she said, get your suitcase off there. This is a wastebasket. Uh, you're not allowed to be doing that. And then a few minutes later, he, he did leave. Someone uh, came along in a suit with a newspaper, and he tucked it into the throat. The throat was about that big. And, uh, and there it was, just sticking out. So another three minutes, someone came along, picked it up a little bit, looked at it, uh, and then put it back in. It wasn't what he wanted to read. And then another couple of minutes later, someone uh, came along and just took it out and walked on. So the, the, the life of, a, of the observation and sitting and observing people is my passion. And uh, I have lots of stories, wonderful stories. So, but Holly White was a great writer. And he used to sit in the office next to me. And he used to, it was almost like a poet. And he would say, if you want to see the place with activity, put out food. Perfect. And so then <laughs> when I go around the world, the places I like to uh, sit and watch people are ice cream stands. Because uh, ice cream is really fun to watch people buy it and then sit and eat it. And here they are. Three of them are eating ice cream. And one of them is eating French fries. Uh, and, and they often eat together. You know, they're sort of in unison together. Now, this is the most unusual picture you will ever see because everyone is eating ice cream except for the kid. It's usually the other way around, and the kid doesn't even have ice cream all over his face. So I said, my God, this is really a precious moment. So then I quickly took another photograph, and there he is looking at me, telling me, see, <laughs> you know. So you never know what's going to happen as you emerge uh, as you become part of people's lives by watching and appreciating who they are. And then, uh, we all know this, you know, one of the best things about water is the look and feel of it. It's not right to put water before people and then keep them away from it. And you know her toe is going in and out of that. And, uh, and then benches are artifacts, the purpose of which is to punctuate architectural photographs. They're not so good for sitting, absolutely right. So the one on the top is in front of a library where you really should have social seating. And the other one is in a bookstore in our neighborhood, which I think is being replaced by a real estate office, which is really sad. Uh, and then water, this is, a, this is a world record of people with their shoes off. People in good places take their shoes off. It's an indicator. Uh, and that is really extraordinary. And then affection is another indicator of people feeling comfortable and, and good about where they are. So Holly White wrote at the end, uh, we found this after he died, is about, I end in praise of small spaces, 
the multiplier effect is tremendous. It's not just the number of people using them or the number who pass by and enjoy them vicariously or even the larger number who feel better about the city center for knowledge of them. For a city, such places are priceless. Whatever the cost, they're built of a set of basics and they are right in front of our noses if we will look. So that's the stage on which we have been operating for the last 40 years. And uh, we've worked all over the world something like 47 countries in 1,000 cities, sort of leading this and, and stimulating the thinking around placemaking. And the big uh, obstacle are, are the professionals, frankly, and city governments or governments. Uh, and as you move towards a place-led uh, approach, the quality of the place increases dramatically. And as you think about level, the level of community engagement and ownership, Community engagement is not to get people's ideas, it's to get them involved in shaping something that delivers an outcome that they can participate in, ownership. So I, I, I hate this, these community engagement practices where you already know what you're going to do, the DOTs do it, uh, and they give you uh, a product that they've already decided what to do, and then they're asking you for input. That's just bullshit. Uh, so the, one of the biggest disappointments in my life I've always liked Canadians, and I always thought Canadians were kind of leading a little bit better. And I was disappointed recently. This is a, in Toronto, this uh, park, if you want to call it, uh, won the Landscape Architecture Design Award for about, for about two or three years ago, Sherburn Commons. So um, they think that this is brilliant design where you have black stones in one path and white stones in another path and so on. Um, well, this kid was brought by his two parents and he sort of walked around a little bit and then he got really intrigued with taking the white stones and putting them into the black stones. <laughs> and, uh, and so they quickly put them back and left. And then another couple came along and uh, fortunately there are the two parents and two children so in one of those white stone zones, one child could be on a swing, and in another one a few ways down, they could do that. So they couldn't even be together. So how could anyone win an award for something like this? It's just, it's just blew my mind. But there's also something else going on, and this is really powerful. Um, in Dufferin Grove Park in Toronto, in a fairly difficult neighborhood, <coughs> this woman, let me get a little glass of water. Ooh. This woman uh, decided, she was pregnant, and she decided that she had a choice between being afraid or bored, and she chose being afraid. And so she went into the, this park and started working with what they call tufts uh, in that park, and together with some of her other neighbors, they were neighbors too, uh, they built a Portuguese bread oven. Now, I don't think in any book on park design or development there's a bread oven. Uh, and, uh, but they went even further and they built a kitchen in the, in the park that they could come out and have these community uh, meals together. Now, this, is, this isn't in the, any book either uh, because the parks department didn't know what to do to make it work. Uh, and so parks departments have become so narrow as to what they can offer uh, as a public space to communities. Uh, these people have broken out of that jail and created something that is totally owned by the community because the community couldn't use the park because of the people who were using it. So this is their playground, pretty dynamic playground. And believe me, everyone goes there. Uh, and this is their uh, amphitheater where they have performances. So. They have made that park theirs. They own it, and they cherish it, and, and they keep growing it to make it better. Now, another big disappointment of mine was watching the progression of Lincoln Center to a bunch of architectural iconic designs. Uh, we know from our work everywhere that this iconic architecture is more about the object than it is about the place. And, uh, so they have this raised area with some trees and you put some chairs in it, so maybe it's sort of okay. And then they do this building, which is really an architectural wonder. I mean, imagine having a green roof slopes down, but how many people can you get to sit there and have dinner? 
And then they have a water feature, which is really good to look at, but where can you sit to do any, to even participate in it? So go, so this, you see this would, uh, this wins the award, but this is a place. And then this wins an award, but this is a place. So what's the disconnect between design competitions and awards and place? There's a big difference between them. Uh, this is actually an amazing piece of architecture, but because there's so many people involved in it, it can't win an award because you can't really see the architecture. Uh, and then in Perth, Australia, at the same time Lincoln Center was doing that, uh, we got involved in a whole cultural center, and these are some institutions, uh, state library, museums, uh, either heritage buildings uh, in the brown or brutalist buildings in the, in the others. Uh, it created a totally lifeless area, and we were brought down about 10, 10 15 years ago to do a placemaking plan with a community. Uh, and so this is what it was, this very short story. Uh, so we left, and we came back two la years later. So this is a placemaking vision. That's not a design. All it is is a set of ideas that people came up with that, that we put onto paper, and then we left, and two years later we came back, and they didn't do anything that was on that plan. Everything they did was much better than what was on that plan. So they got started, and then they created something far more dynamic. So this is a before and after. Uh, before, this, this totally blew me away. This was done by a television personality uh, who, who had a horticultural show. So look at that. And then he did this uh, and that. It's just extraordinary. Uh, and then this actually became a farm, a garden. Uh, and then this building, museum, uh, became this. So the whole place became alive and became the biggest destination in Western Australia because of what people did in it that made it theirs, that gave it the kind of quality of experience uh, that really was fantastic. So uh, that was a pleasure. And it also, you know, the idea that the community is the expert just kept reinforcing that. And that's, we're just constantly, every day, just in, uh, wowed by what a community can come up with and think about what they'd like to do. So the strategy for implementation uh, is to create energetic anchors of activity, the power of 10, we call it. Bring the inside out, which is what happened in Perth. Uh, instead of looking at buildings, you now just see people and activity, uh, like those pictures I showed for Lincoln Center. And then lighter, quicker, cheaper. This is a fantastic, simple idea. In other words, you do a plan, with a community, there's a power of 10. I'm not going to get into that very much. But the short term is one to four months, and long term is two years. So that's within the time frame that we as human beings, who aren't professional and like to take on long term projects, we can tolerate and we can enjoy that experience because we will see results quickly. So you're never finished, crowdsource ideas, and again, placemaking is community organizing. So the power of 10, think of Norman. And think of the destinations in Norman, the good and the bad, and the ones with opportunities. And then take one. Uh, so there, if you have 10 places, maybe they're not working, but uh, some of them are, and you, some of them can get better. The ones that you can get better, you put a yellow dot on, and those show that they're an opportunity. And then the ones that are bad are red, and the ones that are green are good. You can put a yellow on a green, and you can put a yellow on a red. Uh, so you can, as a community, you can, within three hours, you can take 60 people and have them take a vision of what could be done that quickly around the power of 10. Uh, and then when you get down to one particular place, you can break it down into 10 places. But it's always about use. It's not about design. Uh, what would you like to do in those places? So it's not a design process. It's a using, it's a programming use process. So at Harvard, We've been doing this uh, for a number of years. Uh, we did some work on Harvard Square, which is up in the corner there. And then the thing that really blew us away was when Harvard, for 350 years, just had this Harvard yard, had grass, nothing else. And then all of a sudden, one day, these chairs appeared. Changed the whole dynamic of that whole area. 
and it brought in all kinds of uses that people would never have seen before. So then our work was to activate this. And there's a much longer story, but this became the focus of creating the central gathering place at Harvard. And so we broke it down, power 10, 10 places. Well, this happens to be 14. And we started with six, the number six. And we did that. Uh, highly programmed, became the center of, of all kinds of activity. And the metric was bump rates. The professor of economics decided that the number of times you bumped into someone coming through here was a metric that would be uh, quantifiable. Uh, and so then we started working on, we're working on four now, we've been working in the winter on that with skating rinks and other things. And, uh, and, that's, and as we get through this lighter, quicker, cheaper activations, we'll eventually get to where this can be, without hesitation, the greatest destination within the Harvard community. And then we can work on other places which are actually beginning to happen. Sort of our biggest one that, that really blew me away was working uh, in Detroit, in downtown Detroit, uh, which we've been doing since, I think, uh, to, uh, 1999. Uh, and, uh, but downtown Detroit really went into a, a really deep depression. Uh, and uh, in 1999, we came and we did a, a project. But anyway, so uh, Detroit and Campus Martius, the, uh, there's a, uh, a uh, monument right there in the middle, in the heart of Detroit, okay? Look at that. And that's going to be there in 2000. No, uh, 1917 and 2000. They just took everything out, totally emptied. Uh, we came in about 1999 and did a plan for what is Campus Martius. They implemented it. But uh, in 2013, this guy, Dan Gilbert, who owns Quicken Loans, uh, he, uh, we did a placemaking vision. We started out doing a master plan, but we don't like master plans. So we did this placemaking vision activation plan. So we announced it uh, the beginning of April in 2013. And uh, we implemented it. This is the vision that we gave in 2013. And then we implemented it. Uh, and uh, part of the implementation, this is all in three months that we implemented it, because it was a lighter, quicker, cheaper, program driven. Uh, these are the kind of program activities uh, that were there. And then Southwest Airlines, which is a partner of ours, we work with them on their, uh, on their program around the heart of the community all over the, all over the country. Uh, we put in a beach that they sponsored, they, they paid for. And that was a game changer because the same month that Detroit went bankrupt, this happened. So you, you see that it was a kind of the beginning of the future really kind of erupted at that same time. And that's Dan Gilbert playing the piano. So the whole place became an innovation hub, creativity, in, uh, industry, everything became the, the center. And it's, it's really changed a lot. So then the other thing that, uh, you know, the big obstacle are the automobile and how that has taken over our lives. And so when you design your community around cars and traffic, you get more cars and traffic. Uh, when you design your community around people and places, you get more people. Uh, I've got to go faster. Uh, and, and places. So the power of 10 streets is places. If you have these kinds of places, uh, and this is uh, Mike Lydon you'll meet later, this is on our street in our neighborhood. You know? And these are illegal. These are, not, uh, these are uh, tree guards, not benches. Okay? You're not allowed to do the, put a bench out. So uh, these are the benches, and of course, uh, everyone uses them, include, including dogs. And then the whole concept of a street uh, in terms of being shared or places, uh, you can move from these horrible intersections that we have everywhere to one that is more shared. And you can take a place like that, turn it into that. Uh, and you get, and the whole purpose that uh, this Hans Monderman had was to create eye contact between people and, and vehicles. And he did that. Uh, extraordinary. And the, and the uh, crashes went down, the injury rates, rates went down. And our person who runs our transportation program agenda nationally, uh, we took him over there, and uh, that's him standing in the middle of the intersection. Uh, there are no lights, there are no stop signs. You come into it, 
and you look around and you figure out how to get through. And he'd say he, he survived that. And then we put him in a, in a seat out in the middle of the intersection. Uh, and he's, he was transformed. He came to Jesus at that moment. He realized that he could. So if you want vehicles to behave like a village, uh, build a village. And essentially what it means, and this is the big idea, is the transfer of power and responsibility from the state to the individual and the community. Eye contact, creating places where you connect with people. Uh, so lighter, quicker, cheaper, very quick. This is uh, my favorite one anywhere in the world. Forty years ago, this friend of ours took the back of this building and painted it and put garage structures in front of it. So there's the paint. That's what it was. Became that. And then these are garage structures with uh, artist design facades. Did this in 30 days and has 60 people working there. Transformative. You can do it on many scales. So. Going back, we can turn everything upside down. Uh, these are the characteristics of great public spaces. Good places breed healthy activity. People attract people. You can read it. Uh, takes a community to create a place. Amenities that make a place comfortable are critical. You know, you can't have anything less than excellence, and it has to be a campaign. Uh, develop a vision, communicate it, look for impediments, organize a strong team, attack complacency, produce short-term wins, take on bigger challenges, and connect change to the culture of the community. So that's what can happen quickly, everywhere, at any scale, in anywhere in the world. Uh, and the people that can do it, these are the people that are the heroes of every community, and you have a lot, I understand. The leaders are visionaries with a poorly developed sense of fear and no concept of the odds against them. They make the impossible happen. And those are zealous nuts. So we're always looking for zealous nuts, and it's a badge of honor uh, you cannot be better than that. So we've worked everywhere. Uh, the convergence around place uh, is the impact can be phenomenal. Uh, all of these things can be enhanced by the idea of the place and places that you can create in your community. And that's the new paradigm, we believe, for the, for the communities of the future. And remember, architecture is frozen music, urban planning is composition, and placemaking is improvisational street performance. So here are some of the resources that you can use. Thank you. So I'll get her. Yeah. OK, a couple quick summary notes. Uh, if you come to programs in planning, landscape architecture, urban design, or architecture, you may be studying trash cans. You may be eating ice cream and studying that. Um, and with the right amount of seasoning, you too can become a zealous nut. The idea becomes observing behavior to better design public spaces. I also want to say a little bit about the disconnect between planning and design. I have served uh, in my current capacity for 15 years. Um, people tell me I look the same, but uh, the gray hairs that are creeping in are solely due to my work with architects, engineers, and contractors. Planning is about implementation. And our second speaker, Susan Silberberg, is an accomplished city planner, urban designer, architect, author, and educator. She is the founder of Civic Moxie, the planning, urban design, and placemaking group. She has taught at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Department of Urban Studies and Planning for 15 years. She currently tells me she is not on appointment there, but they are shamelessly using her on their website to promote their program. She is currently involved in a number of projects throughout the Northeast, uh, Manchester, New Hampshire, Portland, Maine, and she will be speaking today on placemaking from ideas to action. Please welcome Susan Silverberg. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about action today and getting things done. Everyone wants to get things done, right? Yes? Okay. Um, getting things done is really at the heart of placemaking. It's about making. It's about people embracing activity to move forward, to improve their lives, to create economic opportunity, um, and it's really at the core of what we do. 
I'm very interested as a planning professional. I balance teaching and research with my firm, Civic Moxie. I'm very interested as a planning professional in thinking about how to move to action and to really avoid plans sitting on the shelf. Um, no one wants to create a planning master plan or a document that sits on the shelf. And I think that there's a way um, to use the lessons learned from placemaking and the kinds of spontaneous, um, smaller tactical projects that Fred was talking about, that others will talk about today, um, to give lessons to kind of the broader range of planning projects um, that we have as professionals. How many of you are planning professionals in the audience? Okay, so um, that's good. Um, and this really is about taking the heart of our definition of placemaking at MIT, which is it's really an act of people coming together in their physical environment to improve, um, to design, to maintain, to program spaces, to really improve their quality of life, and also enhance community interaction and social capital. And so in order to kind of base this in terms of how I'm trying to translate these kind of lighter, quicker, cheaper projects and tactical projects, into um, lessons for kind of the broader uh, profession of planning. I want to just highlight very briefly two case studies from the MIT publication, Places in the Making. And the first one is a community in Queens. It's part of the New York City DOT Plaza program. Um, we highlighted in our, in our placemaking paper um, that really um, Corona, um, it has a large immigrant population, very uh, low ratio of open space um, to residents and to land area. And the New York City Department of Transportation um, runs a program, and some of you may know of it, it's been going on now probably for 10 years, um, which looks at how do they create a kit of parts um, and to go into communities and have communities begin to form collaborations about giving input on what they would like to see in these unused asphalt spaces that are related to transportation. In this case, in Corona, it was um, an area outside of the um, subway station um, in this large asphalt plaza. And trying to get community input and then to make temporary um, changes. Um, Fred would call it lighter, quicker, cheaper. This is even lighter and quicker. Um, this kit of parts the communities can use um, to come together and um, to assemble it in a way to make things happen that might normally take a long time. Um, in our research, what we saw was that the way that was effective for New York City Department of Transportation um, to do these projects was to go out into the community, um, to be there on festival days and other times when the community was already using the space or areas near the space to get input on what they would like to do in those spaces. And then they were able to rearrange things as they went for different kinds of activities. Um, the principle here was is that if a community is involved in a project from the start and you're very transparent about costs and what you can do, um, that the community can be more of a part that there is more trust that could be built in terms of what could be affordable or not. So for instance, in this case, community really was interested in a water feature. Uh, but being involved in the ground up and understanding all of the components that went into this and that they were going to have to somehow take over maintenance as well, they understood that economically that wasn't possible at this point in time. And that was a much better conversation theoretically than if you would come to a community and say, we can't afford to do this, um, because the community is part of that discussion. Um, another case from our MIT publication is in Bernal Heights in San Francisco, um, which was a community that was a six lane, what a resident there called a traffic sewer, um, which was six lanes of traffic that separated both sides of this community um, and so neighbor didn't know neighbor across the street. And all the things that you would want in a community um, were really taken up by uh, motorists who were doing shortcuts during rush hour to get from one place to another in the city, resulting in things like car crashes into living rooms um, when cars were going too fast. And an outraged um, resident who had no prior experience in civic activism went door to door, really trying to capture people's interest and say, we can do something about this. Um, in fact, uh, Fred and Project for Public Spaces was involved in this project in coming to the community and working with them to think about what could happen in these six lanes of traffic that really would serve residents uh, rather than just the drivers of the cars who were cutting through. And the result was using um, 
contemporary means in order to um, develop a landscape and a park within that way. The interesting thing here is that the neighbors, they had to raise some of the money. That was the deal with the city. So they were very involved hands-on. They also had to figure out how to maintain it. And so there was a whole discussion about who is going to store the watering equipment and water the park this, this month. Uh, where are these tools going to be stored? So really kind of a community decision-making uh, around that park um, that uh, neighbors at the time said really helped them know their neighbor and really work together to collaborate. To collaborate. And the end result um, being a space that helped them take back some of that car space rather than others. I use these two examples as a basis to talk about this notion of placemaking, of communities coming together to form spaces that really serve them in the best way possible. Um, Fred would say that community is expert. I'm thinking here about how the community can shape those spaces in ways that are um, accessible to them. Um, what we found in the MIT research is that the widening emphasis away from the product of the space in all of these uh, was really important, that it really recognized that the act of making actually nurtures um, community capacity and local leadership that's been missing for a long time, um, since before urban renewal, where we've really given up um, this responsibility of designing our spaces and being part of that decision making because it's been handed over to professionals. And so this emphasis on community coming together is just as important as the places that are made. And we call the mutual stewardship um, as part of our research of place and community the virtual cycle of placemaking. And it's really critical in terms of understanding how to take the lessons that uh, we can learn from these kind of shorter, quicker, cheaper projects and translate them to kind of the more traditional planning that one might see in cities, kind of the larger scale planning that would happen. And what we see with this virtual cycle of placemaking in any one of these projects um, there are a number of dis different stages. A community comes together, they organize. There's a problem. Let's organize and fix it. They have to deliberate. Um, there's a design process. Often uh, other firms will come in during many of these stages. You have to find funding. You have to do a build out. Maybe it's host an event. Then you have to program the space. Who's going to run activities? Maintain it over time so that it stays nice. Um, and then evaluate how you did and perhaps reflect and then uh, share that information with others and then start the process over again. This cycle allows a lot of different points of entry for different people, organizations, public agencies. And that's a really important thing to remember. So it really creates a lot of room, a lot of place, if you will, for people to come to the table. Um, and what we found, the cycle in this mutual stewardship of place and community, the community transforms the place, which then transforms the community and so on. So this kind of wonderful reciprocal relationship that can continue over time. Um, and in thinking about that, what, if you could get that and do it for a lot of different kinds of projects at a bigger scale, um, there could be benefits. Um, for government, there could be benefits for communities, for businesses, for everyone within a city or a town. Um, and thinking about how to translate that to bigger projects, to bricks and mortar projects, um, whether it be parks or um, downtown revitalization plans, thinking about creative placemaking, um, and how to use arts and culture, and then thinking about the more tactical things um, that are temporary, that are testing ideas, that are really trying to work on low budget. And so um, I, I want to talk today about ideas to action. And how do you take this flexibility and this idea of impermanence and kind of the lighter, quicker, cheaper, and unorthodox influences, all the things that perhaps government isn't, um, and how do you translate it into kind of larger planning projects and initiatives, and what are some of the struggles with that? And I'm going to keep it real simple, because we're, we're delving into this in our firm and thinking about new ways to get things done. Um, and I'm going to start, I hope you can read this, um, I'm going to start just by trying to outline the tactical and the temporary. So these are things like the tactical urbanism projects um, that Fred showed, things like doing some temporary parklets and parking spaces, um, events. It could be food trucks. It could be pocket parks or parklets, temporary interventions. These are generally targeted to a very specific end, often just a short time frame. 
Um, they're most open to being led by lay people because you can come and you can do something. They can ignore or break the rules and often do. Um, they often have small budgets. They're low risk approach. They're flexible. You can take them out. Um, and they can be pilots for new ideas, so they're very valuable. On the other hand, as a planning professional, most of the work in my firm deals with the long range bricks and mortar projects, often with regulation. And these are things like comprehensive plans for whole towns or cities, thinking about master plans for downtown or a waterfront, parking studies, transit oriented development plans, um, downtown revitalization, rezoning. These have long view of change over many years, prolonged public engagement that can go for years on some of these projects, very high capital costs to implement them. Um, they have more regulation and approvals processes, and they're really mid to long term um, focus on implementation. And so the question is, how do these two pieces come together? And in my world, there's very little overlap in thinking about how the tactical and the placemaking and the community really influences some of these longer pieces. And it's not for want of trying. It's figuring out how to really kind of deeply embed within a kind of a long, uh, long tradition of planning. And so um, I want to think a little bit about where, uh, what the scope of work looks like for some of these projects and how one might approach um, how they look different according to our lessons uh, learn from placemaking. Because in the work that I do, it's really thinking at the core about how on the left to think about a large scale plan as how everything has to kind of funnel down to make a kind of finite plan. And on the right, thinking about planning more as a framework. A framework that different things can plug into over time. Different actors, different funders, uh, different regulators. So that you're creating a framework that allows for some of the placemaking um, values and practices to happen. And this is important because I don't know anyone anywhere has enough money to do what they want to do. Um, there's always going to be a scarcity of resources. I like to think of planning as the allocation of scarce resources. And how do you make a little go a long way? And when you can create a framework that pulls in a lot of different actors and players um, into a project and a framework, you're building capacity for implementation. You're building capacity for ownership. You're building capacity for stewardship. And those are really smart things um, to remember. Um, and so in framing these kind of six principles that we use, um, the things to remember that they really have to consider and embrace this idea about what makes a good space. That's a central question. This is the Project for Public Spaces kind of outline of good spaces. Also, how do you create a collaborative space, what I call the civic water cooler? for people to come together to collaborate on these things. And also, what is the best role of government? Um, how is government used um, in these projects to its best advantage, with the best tools that it has at its disposal? And then how do you allocate scarce resources? And then how do you measure success? All of those are important questions to remember throughout the projects. So I have six points about how to translate placemaking principles to kind of the larger framework of planning. And the first one is having more public meetings does not equal more meaningful and diverse public engagement. And I cannot stress that enough. How many of you love to be at a meeting? Mm -hmm. I don't see any hands up here. Um, it's not. It's not a more uh, effective way. And yet, all of the scopes and the requests for proposals I see from cities and towns always have as a measurement for community engagement and outreach, you must have three public meetings. You must have two workshops. It's not an efficient, effective way for the diverse outreach that we need in projects. Um, we get this. <laughs> And luckily, none of you look like that right now from my point on the stage. Um, the point is, is that the people we get at meetings, by and large, are the people who always attend meetings. They're a small segment. Try to get teens to a planning meeting? No way. Um, young families with children? You've got to be crazy. Um, thinking about even seniors with mobility problems? That's a challenge. Millennials and young professionals? 
They're busy doing other things that are a lot cooler than going to a planning meeting. And so what we get is a subset who becomes a voice for everyone. And so I urge this notion to think about stakeholders in a much more broad way. Stakeholders are not only residents, and they're not only a subset of residents. Um, this is a map we're doing, uh, Civic Moxie is doing the multimodal transportation and land use plan for Manchester, New Hampshire, historic mill yards, a downtown. That city has a lot of capacity. Uh, the name that we gave that project, because no one gets excited about multimodal land use transportation planning project, we gave it the title Manchester Connects. Because this was really, every planning project at its core is about connecting people, ideas, and places. And so thinking about stakeholder engagement and outreach, how are you connecting the best of the capacity of your community with the ideas and the places to make it happen? Because all of these groups are stakeholders, visitors, property owners, investors, nonprofits, the city, residents, every one of them have to be at the place, right, and placemaking at the table in order to get things done. And at different times, different groups of these are going to be available. And you've got to go out to meet people where they are. Forget about the meeting. You have to go where people are, and that means to a lot of different doors um, that need to be opened for you and that you need help um, from people around you in opening. That means schools. That means residents. It means churches and other houses of worship. It means businesses and nonprofits and investors. You go where the people are and you bring them to the planning process. You don't wait for them to come because you have a six o'clock meeting in a school cafeteria. They won't do it. Um, and to think about how other ways to bring them. Um, in Bridgeport, Connecticut, we're doing the Waterfront Master Plan. We teamed with a local nonprofit, um, Groundwork Bridgeport, and they have a high school green team. And these are high school students who have come on as our partners. We're paying them. They're our partners in doing outreach. So they're going door to door, but they're also doing, they're putting up tables at festivals. Um, they're playing games with people and asking questions about how they're going to use the waterfront, getting teens uh, engaged. Meetings in a box. Uh, we create meetings that I wish they were in a box, but they're just simple paper and maps that we can hand out at libraries, at churches, at schools. People can take them home get with five people they know, they're in different languages, and they can offer feedback and then send them in. And also win raffle, you know, they can be part of a raffle to win gift cards and things as an incentive for people to participate. Um, thinking about all of these ways, text signs, seniors love these. Seniors are becoming more and more kind of mobile, uh, mobile uh, friendly, um, all their apps and all of their tablets, and teens love them. Getting feedback in real time that shows up on a website about what people are saying about a particular space. It's a way to engage people, and so I, I urge you to think well beyond the meeting. The second one is, is that I think every project needs to bake in action and early wins in the scope of work, no matter how vast the project is. Doesn't matter if it's a comprehensive plan for a whole city, um, a transportation plan. How do you engage and excite residents to get involved? And one way to do that is to bake in this action. Um, we like to think of it in terms of the kind of short term, what's today. The yellow is kind of low barrier to entry and temporary thinking about um, longer term and then bricks and mortar. And how do you capture that green line on every project to get people excited about something? Uh, in Bridgeport, um, waterfront master plan, there's never been a master plan for the waterfront. It is uh, 24 miles of waterfront and much of it looks like this. Uh, former factories, some material storage yards, lots of chain link fence that is a barrier from really the disadvantaged communities that live along that waterfront to the water and to all of the amenities. And so thinking about how to get, um, how to get people involved because for years they've wanted access to the waterfront and it hasn't happened. And the city is really very committed at this point to doing it. And so making it real, we were able to take that year-long master planning process and carve off a piece at the end because the city's been an amazing partner on that project and to say we're going to make that pathway real and the minute we said to people we're going to change that from just an abstract green line around the waterfront to something real about what's doable short term people started to get interested and that's when they started to come to meetings 
um, because there was something that was tangible that they could get involved in. And so we started to have this real interest and trust that got built. And so the short win projects are very important for that. I would also say ditch the traditional planning report. Um, there are very few people who ever read it. Um, think about all the great planning work that's done as a series of appendices that you can justify what you did, that people can read them. We like to work in planning kits. We call them action kits. And what we do is we say, okay, what are all the priorities and what would a community need to really have the resources to do this? Because it's one thing to say, we're going to do this, and it's another to say, do you have all the resources at your disposal? And that's one of the things that I think planners can do, is we can provide the resources. Um, these were action kits for Worcester, Massachusetts, a kind of downtown ground floor strategy. And what they involve is really going out. The city wanted to do a block party. We did the measuring, what size beer garden, because beer garden is very important these days. What size beer garden would fit on this square in front of the Hanover Theater? Different sizes. Uh, how many people could be here? What are the permits that you need for this? What are the checklists that you have to go through? Um, we did all of this, and then as the planning was real time, um, what are some of the tactical urbanism elements that you might use from your local home store so they know that this project could be a $35,000 project, kind of long-term, kind of thinking about changing that space. Really trying to make it real uh, for people in these action kits. Um, what goes along with that is using planning efforts to offer real-time support and technical assistance where it's needed most. Um, so that community, they really needed this budget done. We did the budget for them. In Worcester, they were also trying to activate the common um, right in the center of downtown, trying to rent vacant storefronts. And there was an issue with food trucks and restaurants, real, restaurants really wanting more support, um, but not knowing how to get a critical mass of people. And so we looked at what some of the barriers were um, for restaurants in the downtown. Food trucks wanted to be on the oval in the common, uh, but there was a regulation, only one food truck at a time. Um, and so we did some case study research to show everyone that in fact more food trucks meant more people, which is good for restaurants as well. And they were still a little iffy, and I had a conversation at five o'clock in the morning one day with one of the main food truck operators um, who said, you know, we talked about it, and I said, what if you provide a map on Food Truck Thursdays, it's all the restaurants that are open for lunch, and get the restaurants to offer a discount. And so you're promoting the restaurants while you're uh, on, at the food truck. And that's what we did. He said, that's great, but there's no map. And I said, we'll do one for you. And so we did a map, which had never been done, of downtown restaurants. And that's what I mean by real-time support. It's great to tell a community you need a map, but then you need to find someone who's going to do the map, who has the graphic skills, and it becomes one more barrier. So how about baking some of that into the planning process to help people move along, to give them the capacity to do what they want to do and keep them going? Um, I'm going to go through this because of time. Um, the other thing is to front load community engagement and implementation in the planning process. They're not separate phases of the process, but often, you know, the way we lay it out, because we need to be able to quantify things, we have a typical planning scope. And it's existing conditions and inventory. We do an analysis. We do a concept design. We get some feedback. We do a final design. Then there's implementation charts, and the community outreach kind of goes through all of that. I like to think about doing community outreach early and often and doing it up front right as you're starting the project, because that whole process, we do something called a collaborative roadmap, where we're looking at what are the goals, how can they be done, and who can do them in the community, and why they would do them. And if you ask those questions on day one, then you know who you have to bring to the table. Then you know who are those people you're going to bring, not in a public meeting, because that was rule number one, uh, but to think about bring them to the table and get them involved in the planning process for buy-in. And so it's very important to think about engagement right from the get-go. And the last piece that I would just like to say is that planning without implementation, I think, is the single most detrimental thing you can do for community spirit, for public sector credibility, and chances for robust public buy-in. And the reason I say this is that a lot of communities have money for planning, but they don't have money for implementation. 
And if I had to urge one thing is that before communities take the planning money, to really think hard about where they're going to get the resources for implementation, even in a very broad way. Because if you do a plan and people get excited and you can't implement it, the next time you try to do something, it just gets harder and harder to engage people. People are ready to go. They are ready to act. They are ready for change. And what we often hear in places where we work, where a lot of previous planning has been done, is I don't trust the city. They haven't done anything. They haven't listened. Uh, why should I attend another meeting? Um, we hear this, and there's great apathy. And it's not because people aren't interested in change. They just don't believe that another planning meeting is going to get it. And when you have a lot of previous planning reports and planning studies that have been done, it's very hard to get people engaged to move on. And so I would say to think about placemaking, not that we have to remake places that are there. People have places. To think about making a place is making a portion of a space available for someone to come to the table. And that's really about how to translate what we're learning in placemaking and the smaller projects to the kind of larger scope of larger projects is how do we make a place? Because if you can make a place at the table for varied stakeholders, um, then you've built in the capacity for implementation and moving from ideas to action. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>